Good afternoon and hello, uh, good morning in other parts of the world. Uh, I am Amelie Ekwe, I'm the Academic Dean of Globeethics.net and I have the privilege to welcome you to this first Blue Table webinar of the Globeethics.net Academy. We are very much looking forward to what Professor Ross Upshur has to present to us. He is a physician by formation and serves as a professor at the Dalalana Public Health School of the University of Toronto in Canada. His expertise, which um, reaches back to times prior to uh, this pandemic, he has worked um, extensively in areas of philosophy of medicine, but particularly in global health, public health and ethical principles and standards related to public health management in pandemic times. He invites us now to reflect on ethical issues in the COVID-19 pandemic and the question, will we ever learn? Ross, thank you very much for joining us and for having accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's a very great pleasure to be with you today and an honor and a privilege. So I'm going to just pull up my slides. It's a rather daunting task to summarize all of the uh, considerable ethical issues raised by uh, infectious disease uh, epidemics, but hopefully I will be able to uh, do this in a succinct and uh, a clear manner. Uh, one of the things I'm going to reflect upon are, uh, is this notion of lessons learned, and you'll see as I uh, walk through this how I've uh, thought about this. I've been working on uh, ethics and public health, ethics and infectious disease uh, for over 25 years now. Uh, and so that's where my uh, feeling that I keep saying the same thing over and over again comes from. So I'm going to start with a, an apology. Canadians are known to be uh, rather polite uh, and uh, you know you're with a Canadian when they say thank you to a, 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 an ATM. Uh, but I do want to apologize in advance if I miss key points, if I mislead, if I don't quote the proper theories. But most of all, I want to apologize if I waste your time, which is our most uh, precious uh, resource these days. So interestingly, yesterday, uh, there was, a, you know, the ethics issues in the pandemic were front and center in the news, particularly around uh, the World Health Organization's uh, claiming that the uh, COVID-19 vaccine inequity is causing a catastrophic moral failure or uh, unequal vaccine distribution is a moral outrage. And the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, has been using a very strong normative language throughout this uh, uh, pandemic, particularly when it comes to the uh, concept of solidarity, and hopefully we'll have some time to talk about that. But uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I want to take us to the distant past, move to the recent past, talk about what lessons uh, have been learned or haven't been learned. And then I'm going to articulate what I call the pandemic playbook, because my sense on working on several infectious disease outbreaks over the last uh, 20 years, the first SARS here in Toronto, uh, got me and sort of changed my career and turned my focus from um, being more interested in the epidemiology of uh, respiratory uh, infections into the sort of social, political and ethical dimensions through our preparations for H5N1 to H1N1 to Zika, Ebola, and bring us to the present. Uh, and in each of those, I think there's some structural ethical issues for which we should have been prepared uh, when we came into COVID, and then maybe some discussion about how ethics can play a greater role uh, in uh, managing uh, pandemics. I want to start with two quotations from Albert Camus' book, The Plague, and I was encouraging everybody to read this early on in the pandemic, but now, of course, we're living the plot. Uh, but he does make two interesting uh, observations. One is that uh, pestilences or plagues or pandemics have a way of recurring in the world. But when they happen, it's hard to believe in the ones that crash down on our heads from the blue sky. And this time last year, as the world was moving into lockdown after the initial emergence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, from China, everybody was kind of feeling like, where did this come from? 
But he further observes that there's been as many plagues as wars in history, and they always take people equally by surprise. So despite all of the investment in preparedness and planning, why would a new uh, coronavirus take us by surprise? So if we go back in history and uh, in uh, Thucydides' uh, history of the Peloponnesian War, he has a lucid uh, description of the plague of Athens. And uh, one of the observations he makes is that physicians were, uh, they weren't of much service because they didn't know how to treat the disease and they died most thickly as they visited the sick most often nor did any human art succeed any better. Supplications, divinations were equally futile till the overwhelming nature of the disaster at last put a stop to them altogether. Thucydides describes how social uh, order started to break down in Athens as the uh, plague emerged and uh, lawlessness occurred. And so far, uh, we've been relatively good in COVID-19 at maintaining social order, though it has been strained in various places. The other interesting thing is this uh, unique epidemiological observation that people who come to care for people with infectious diseases are the ones, of course, who are at greatest risk. So physicians and uh, loved ones and caregivers, in fact, just diseases uh, uh, spread through person-to-person -person contact uh, by various means. And so caregivers are the ones who are disproportionately affected. And that's been the case here uh, with SARS-CoV-2 as it was with Ebola, as it was with uh, other uh, outbreaks. I put forth the picture of the uh, leper uh, in their garb with their hat and their gown and the Lazarus bell to ring to warn people of their imminent arrival so they could step aside. Uh, because we know that historically infectious diseases are strongly associated with stigma. Uh, and uh, I also put up the prayer of separation, which was often uh, read to uh, lepers once they were determined to have leprosy. And so if anybody has any lack of clarity about the relationship between normative language and the experience of infectious disease, I've just bolded all of the forbids and commands. It essentially casts you out of uh, human existence. And if I noted when I went back and reread this, I've used this slide for many years, uh, a lot of those proscriptions sound an awful lot like what we're now being asked to do for public health measures. You know, don't congregate, don't leave your house, uh, you know, you must uh, keep all of your uh, uh, tools and uh, accoutrements to yourself. Uh, so these are recurrent themes through history. And we've often used this need to separate the diseased from the well as a, as a default approach to uh, managing epidemics. And in this case, this is a picture taken from a newspaper in Canada uh, during a smallpox uh, outbreak in the late 19th century. And the idea here was that uh, all of the sick were contained in the quarantine hospital and the population who thought that they were well thought the best way to protect themselves then was to basically lock people in uh, the uh, a hospital itself. So these recurrent notions of separating the diseased from the well, and we're seeing that with the use of isolation and quarantine. So SARS in uh, 2003 was a major uh, warning sign to uh, us about the new uh, global environment. And on the other side here, I have the famous picture of the plague doctor uh, who has the personal, he's got gloves, he's got gown, he's got a mask, the pointed uh, uh, mask has a poultice because they would be entering into, you know, very congested uh, uh, congregate living settings where people were close together with poor ventilation. And of course, bubonic plague is uh, buboes are large nests of uh, uh, confluently filled uh, uh, lymph nodes filled with pus. So the stick was there for the purposes of uh, uh, inspection and palpation. SARS was supposed to be uh, the new era, the new age of epidemics as seen in Newsweek, but also these questions about what's the truth of SARS? Why does the virus spread? Uh, was China covering up? Should we be afraid? Now this is uh, 18 or 19 years ago. Uh, so it's in our recent memory that it seems, as I said, for, to pick up on the point from Camus, that we had never had these thoughts before when SARS-CoV-2 arose.
we come to the modern age and you see that healthcare professionals are using more or less the same form of personal protective equipment. Uh, the only difference is the advent of plastics, but gowns, gloves, masks, uh, and, uh, and uh, as a barrier to uh, being transmitted from infection. We then became concerned about H5N1, a highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, uh, this was shown to be highly fatal in the uh, small proportion of humans that uh, did contract it. And the issue here became uh, that the clock was ticking. We hadn't had a major uh, epidemic of influenza for several years. Uh, many people involved in public health and epidemiology were concerned about the uh, advent of a new pandemic. Uh, you can see here on the on the right, uh, these gentlemen, there was a case of highly pathogenic H5N1 found in a bird. I think this is near the border between uh, Romania and Hungary. And the only people at risk are these poor gentlemen uh, fogging the train. And I like to joke that I've never really seen a, a bird hitchhiking uh, on top of a train. They're actually flying high above us, but we tend to recurse to some some form of symbolic behavior to show that we're on the, on the, on the case. Of course, H5N1 did not become uh, the pandemic, but in 2009, we had the swine flu epidemic, uh, an H1N1 influenza virus that had uh, remnant genetic material from the 1918-1919 swine flu. And of course, this caused uh, considerable concern. Uh, there was uh, fears that we wouldn't have enough uh, ventilators, that uh, intensive cares were going to become overwhelmed with uh, cases, and that uh, we would, didn't have the health system capacity to respond for in 2009. And now, of course, a concern about vaccines. When there was a death in Toronto, all of a sudden there was a huge demand for uh, H1N1 vaccine. And we're seeing similar concerns now with COVID vaccines. As much as there's some hesitancy in the population, uh, many older adults in particular are strongly interested in getting the vaccine. And we're having difficulty in terms of setting priorities for the uh, distribution of doses. And that's a global problem as well. I want to reflect a little bit about Ebola. Uh, so now we're up to 2014. Um, Ebola was declared a, a, a threat to peace and security by the UN. At the time, it was considered the biggest threat to uh, 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 security uh, in the history of the UN. And now it seems like a rather manageable outbreak in comparison to what we're seeing in, uh, in COVID-19. And this notion that we need uh, major uh, international cooperation, uh, this concern about uh, security uh, that recurs with these large outbreaks. Of course, Ebola was the trial run for the use of lockdowns. And the first time a lockdown had been used in a major urban environment was during Ebola in September of 2014, uh, when Sierra Leone had a three-day lockdown so they could go uh, door to door to try to take a census of people with fever. There was concern that uh, cases were being hidden from public health because of the stigma and the highly fatal nature of the disease. And of course, uh, almost every jurisdiction around the world has had some form of lockdown, including here in Toronto. The other interesting thing about epidemics is they tend to bring out the darker side of our uh, uh, of human behavior. Uh, black markets start to uh, 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 thrive. Uh, in Ebola, it, uh, uh, rumors were uh, circulating that uh, uh, whole blood uh, from survivors was protective and uh, survivors of Ebola were reluctant to come forward uh, to identify themselves. And there was interest in the health community for setting up cohorts to follow, to look at the long-term consequences, but people were afraid that they would be captured and held against their will uh, to have their uh, uh, blood uh, uh, taken from them. And again, we see around the world, including in Canada, various black markets uh, of, uh, being created. The other issue to think about is the uh, long-term consequences of, uh, of disease uh, for survivors and their families. So not only do you have uh, the large amount of grief in communities from, uh, from the high fatality associated with the disease, but you have the uncertainty uh, that people who have been ill, uh, the fear that they might become reinfected. So we know that 
pandemics, uh, you know, all people uh, have hugely disruptive uh, impacts on every aspect of human life. And that's, that's very much every aspect of a pandemic response uh, entails uh, ethical issues. I would be remiss to go on without mentioning MERS and Zika, uh, both of which, uh, so Zika was a public health emergency of international concern in 2016. The point I'm trying to make with this uh, quick walk through recent history is that since the international health uh, uh, regulations were re uh, revised in 20, 2005 and created this concept of a public health emergency of international concern, we've had several H1N1, Ebola, Zika, now SARS-CoV-2 and Ebola, all of which have become uh, public health emergencies of international concern, which is the highest level of global alert, which means that the impact of pandemics or epidemics is becoming recurrently common, and thus it's something that we should be extremely well prepared for. So after Ebola, there was a considerable uh, uh, discussion around lessons learned. Uh, so Bill Gates had a major paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Major organizations uh, had uh, started to worry about what are the lessons to, to be learned. Here in Canada, we've had uh, lessons learned from uh, SARS in 2003 and from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. Uh, though, as I point out here, it's very hard to find what those lessons are because the content of those reports have been archived and aren't available for easy access. So it's like we consciously forget. Uh, the, these notions also that a wake-up call. So SARS was a wake-up call for global health, as was the H1N1 swine flu. And if you look to COVID, of course, it's another global wake-up call for which we need to learn lessons. And you can see from headlines that the ethical issues for COVID-19 have been strikingly similar to issues that have been risen by other ones, the use of quarantine, uh, the notion that we're going to run out of uh, vaccine uh, or ventilators, that uh, we're gonna have to resort to some new forms of social monitoring, such as contact apps or vaccine passports or immunity licenses. So uh, after Ebola, uh, I got a bit grumpy about all of this. And I said that the, when I looked at all of the lessons learned documents and summarized them, what we found is that most of the lessons that we needed to learn were in some ways, nor were in most ways, normative or ethical lessons. And that the most powerful lesson we learned from Ebola was that we don't learn lessons. And uh, so I sort of quipped that we either have a form of collective amnesia or collective narcolepsy because we keep forgetting or keep falling asleep and we need to uh, hit the snooze button and uh, learn our lessons all over again. And so we summarized our thinking in two papers, one published in 2015 in Public Health Ethics, and then we revisited it with uh, a paper recently in a, 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 in a series of papers in the Journal of Bioethical Inquiry on uh, COVID a symposium that we published. So what I'd like to argue is that there, are, there is this pandemic playbook and on the left hand side are the events and on the right hand issue side are the ethical issues. And my argument is all of these are more or less predictable. All of these have occurred in almost every outbreak I've mentioned. And as I've uh, tried to indicate, go back into antiquity. So, you know, hearkening to that uh, quotation from uh, Thucydides, there's usually high early morbidity and mortality, particularly around healthcare professionals and caregivers. And this was exactly the case in Wuhan. Uh, physicians, nurses, uh, family members who come to care became ill. And the issues these arise are predictably issues for healthcare professionals around their obligations to care for people uh, in the uh, context of a pandemic. And in 2005, I co-chaired the uh, duty to care of health professions in pandemics uh, to sort of explore the issues of uh, where these obligations and how, how extensive they were because most of the regulatory bodies and codes of ethics were silent. But there's also this reciprocal uh, duty to protect on behalf of health systems to aid and assist uh, healthcare providers to prevent them from becoming ill. High levels of uncertainty, again, back to Thucydides, we don't have effective treatments, we don't know how to care for patients. Exactly the same case uh, with SARS-1, 
uh, H1N1 was a little different. We had uh, at least a vaccine and some uh, medication, but with SARS-CoV-2, same thing. No effective medication, no vaccine, a totally novel uh, virus. And this raises all of the issues around research ethics and whether we need to countenance, uh, countenance uh, pandemic exceptionalism, that is to shorten up or somehow uh, reduce the uh, strictures of uh, research ethics oversight. And uh, one of the first things we did with our WHO ethics committee was to actually argue against pandemic exceptionalism and to argue that that in times of an emergency is no time to take shortcuts on research ethics. As I've alluded to, there's always a need for counter public health uh, countermeasures to contain spread. Uh, this you know, might include things like isolation, quarantine, uh, some form of movement restriction, uh, count, you know, uh, uh, contact tracing apps, uh, vaccine passports, all of these public health measures to uh, protect the community. And this, of course, raises issues with respect to public health ethics and how we think about justifying these restrictions, how we balance the needs and rights of individuals versus the needs and uh, rights of a community. And of course, we'll always face scarcity, and this raises issues around resource allocation and priority setting. One of the first issues that came up uh, in high income settings was the need to uh, think about triage policies for critical care resources if the system becomes truly overwhelmed, as was reported in Italy uh, about this time last year. And then uh, scarcity with respect to vaccines. How do you set about to fairly and equitably and justly uh, allocating these resources? And this leads to the last question around structural inequity, local and global, uh, where I started with a quotation from the World Health Organization. And again, a global health or a public health ethics question around how much global solidarity we have. And I will argue all of these were evident and uh, basically written into the script of how this uh, pandemic has played out. And yet it seems that health systems uh, were in the, and uh, countries were uh, trying to start from scratch from the beginning rather than building on what's been known. And of course, we know that these issues are highly complex and that the need to integrate various different forms of knowledge. And you'll see that most uh, health systems uh, defer to uh, some form of evidence-based decision-making in which positive science is given pride of place over uh, the needs of ethics and the need to integrate eth levels of ethical reflection from the personal through clinical, professional, organizational, and up to the global. And my uh, big wish is that the ethical issues would be seen to be co-constitutive with the scientific issues when it comes to responding to uh, a pandemic, particularly in times of high uncertainty. Now, it's not that there isn't a shortage of guidance for this, and they do exist. The World Health, you know, three of these uh, uh, documents I've worked on, including this uh, green book on guidance for managing ethical issues and in infectious disease outbreaks. And I've just completed a study to see the extent to which there's been uptake of these documents in sort of technical and other response documents. And sadly, the uh, uh, penetration of ethical reasoning into uh, guidance and response documents is very poor. And I must conclude with some thoughts around this. And I have to give a uh, 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 pride of place to the Nuffield, Nuffield Council, which published a report on the 28th of uh, January last year, right when around the time when uh, a public health emergency of international concern was de uh, declared for uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, they published a really nice document on research and global health emergency. So very timely. And there's, you know, I've spent uh, 20 years publishing research on virtually every aspect of those uh, uh, pandemic playbook and uh, got me thinking why we're not actually making progress in getting ethical reasoning into pandemic response. So that's where I'd like to open up the discussion. How can ethics be better engaged? So despite complaints about uh, ethics oversight in uh, research, uh, Ethics guidance is well established and uh, many uh, research ethics boards are functioning. But I think we need to consider better ways of translating ethics into pandemic planning and response. And so to that, I think we need to learn from the 
growing uh, field of knowledge translation and implementation science. So implementation science is interesting from an ethical point of view because uh, the most of the focus there has been on is implementation science different from other forms of research so that you don't need ethical oversight. But uh, implementation science uh, really focuses on context and translation of knowledge into particular contexts. So rather than looking at whether implementation science is uh, distinct from other forms of research, we should start to use the techniques of implementation science, the understanding of context, uh, the working uh, with uh, people actually involved uh, on the ground uh, to better get ethics into, uh, uh, into place. I think we need to uh, better use health communications tools, uh, you know, social media, use of video. And I do think we need uh, better preparation and training of health professionals uh, in ethics. So our, our group here in Toronto back in, the, uh, in 2005 prepared a, 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 an ethical framework for responding to uh, pandemic influenza. But when we went back to look at it, uh, we recognized that it actually still had strong utility uh, within a, a, a COVID response. So we articulated in a Canadian context, uh, what we thought were 10 substantive values that needed to be uh, openly discussed and, and, and uh, debated and to inform policy. And we also had a, a focus on uh, procedural values to ensure that there was inclusive, fair uh, decision making. And interestingly, this kind of framework became uh, the backbone of the WHO's uh, pandemic ethics response, but other jurisdictions have taken it up, notably New Zealand, and populated the substantive values with more local values related to uh, the Maori population. So it's a, it's a, it's a useful tool. Uh, we focus particularly on these sort of gluey principles about the need to engage communities to build trust, uh, reciprocity, solidarity, and equity. Um, so I'm going to conclude. Uh, this isn't actually a picture of Sergei Korsakov. It's a bit of a joke. Sergei Korsakov is the Russian neurologist who described Korsakov syndrome, uh, which occurs when people have a, 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 when they lose their capacity to process short-term memory. And I think we've had a kind of collective Korsakov syndrome when it comes to um, uh, pandemics and pandemic preparedness, we seem to forget very quickly uh, what we've experienced recently. Uh, but Santayana, of course, quoted in his, uh, uh, most people know the quotation, but not its source. It came from a series of volumes he published on the history of reason. But he did say that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And we seem to be reliving the same lessons over and over in our ethical response to pandemics. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention. I hope this was of some value and I will stop there.